I'm Giorgio Metta from the Italian Institute of Technology. I'm going to lecture about the ICA, um, a platform for research in embodied cognition. So, um, the overall idea in uh, developing human and robots is that, as in, uh, you know, for many years in the movies and science fiction, uh, we'll be able in the near future to develop robots that can be used uh, in human robot interaction. They can be friendly companions, um, they can solve tasks for us. And, uh, but most importantly, that they behave in a way that is very natural for, uh, for us. Um, we're not the only one um, saying this. Uh, there's also very, uh, you know, several well-known people. In this case, um, Bill Gates, in, already in 2008, was um, saying that if uh, we manage to put uh, a robot in every house, in every home, uh, this will make uh, a huge market, uh, very profitable, and uh, will change uh, the way of living of many, many people. So a robot can be of assistance, uh, can be um, a helper, uh, can organize, help organize our lives, can uh, uh, tend uh, our pets, uh, water our plants, but as most importantly, be a social use because it can be used by the elderly uh, to improve the quality of life. Um, this was, um, you know, one, one possibility. Another one, uh, most recent, uh, this is um, uh, an article from IEEE Spectrum of a few days ago, and uh, basically says that Google um, acquired recently seven robotic companies. So, um, you know, this is one example, but uh, basically big players are starting to believe there's something to be done in robotics. Um, especially, again, in robots that are user-friendly, that can be used in uh, you know, many different uh, situations, not only in the factory, but again, at home, there, there may be a possibility. Um, you know, consider the ICAB, um, we're doing our own development along those lines, uh, with the idea that the robot can become uh, uh, a robot for uh, human-robot interaction. Um, this is a quick summary of what we've done. So we designed a, a robot, a full humanoid. Uh, it's about a meter tall, 25 kilos, uh, 53 degrees of freedom. Uh, the whole complexity in designing the robot was um, especially in trying to give a uh, human shape, uh, sophisticated hands, uh, plethora of sensors, uh, just to make a platform that is very, very useful for researchers. Uh, the platform is completely open source. And uh, this allowed um, distribution beyond a single laboratory. So, uh, particular in this map here, you see uh, we have about 30 robots now, full platforms. Uh, it's one of the few robots that I think was born in Europe and are up in Asia, in Japan and in Korea uh, soon. Um, it's not, uh, you know, um, it's not probably the best in a, in a specific field is uh, most likely a robot that strikes an average in many different components. So it's not the best uh, working robot. If you take, uh, for instance, Asimo from Honda, uh, that's beautiful, beautifully engineered for walking. In this case, uh, we can do some walking, but we're not perfect yet. Um, but on the other hand, it's a robot that has, uh, as I said, hand size, um, can walk and manipulate at the same time. So it allows research at a slightly different level, so it can be uh, more complicated in the sense. This is a summary of the ICAP features. So it has hands, um, nine degrees of freedom, so the fingers are independent uh, to generate different type of graphs. Um, uh, sensors are all human-like, so we don't use, uh, for instance, lasers on, on the ICAP. We have cameras, we have microphones, there are gyroscopes, encoders, for tactile sensors and so forth. The electronics, again, because the robot has been designed for research, the electronics is entirely custom, which means uh, we can program even the very low level of the controllers of the ICAP. This is, again, it's an important feature for researchers um, because researchers typically want to hack the very low level, change the behavior of the, ro of the robot very accurately, and uh, this is a possibility. And as I said, um, the robot is entirely open, uh, which means that we now have a community of designers, not very much on the hardware side, it's still very difficult to modify the robot, 
but on the more on the software side. So there's more um, than a million lines of code uh, available. Um, doesn't mean it's all uh, you know very useful code, but it means there's a lively community that is developing software for the ICA. Uh, if you now move towards uh, um, again the more the research side, um, we basically want to uh, be able to develop complex behaviors on the ICA. Um, although this slide doesn't show it, um, what we also develop is a software system, a middleware that allows people to build uh, basic building blocks, combine them into full-blown applications. So if you want to generate a behavior that instructs the robots to go from A to B, fetch an object, grasp it, and bring it back, um, you can do it by developing, I don't know, the a behavior that does the walking, another one that does stabilization, another one for grasping, uh, visual behaviors, and so forth. And this will be combined by the software system in order to generate the full, the full let's say, um, the full application. Um, in particular, we started uh, recently on a uh, EU project analyzing what it means to instruct the robot to do something. And uh, inspiration from this paper by Trussman and Gleitman, and uh, in saying that, so basically what they were saying here is that uh, in language acquisition, you had to pay attention to uh, two basic facts. Uh, there are two modes of learning. One has to do with the fact that um, sometimes, uh, even if you change a word in a sentence, this word can be uh, entirely generic, can be replaced for another word, and the structure of the sentence remains the same, uh, which means you can start inferring um, the place of the word uh, for the meaning of the word. Let's say, um, today you say, as in this example taken from the paper, the gibbon hit the lemur with a stick. Um, you can replace uh, lemur with whatever, the cat. And you still can infer that this is an object to refer to the verb and so forth. So this will be places for objects in the sentence. Um, and this allows uh, uh, sort of inferring um, the role of certain things in the overall sentence and uh, eventually attaching the meaning to uh, the objects that are the robot or the animal or the infant interacts with. Um, the other possibility is that by changing one word, let's say the, the verb hit, you may change it and the, consequently the structure of the sentence also changes because the meaning is entirely different. This is another uh, possibility, it's also a second mode, let's say, of, of learning that is sort of uh, posited by Trussell and Gleitman in this paper. So basically these two modes um, for us, uh, can be taken only as inspiration, but the important point is to say that this type of sentences can be decoded in a very standard way, so we can identify the verbs, the words, uh, like in this case, uh, the, there's an object after the verb, and there's a tool um, the gibbon is using. Um, so let's translate this into the ICA. Uh, you can say, um, like in this uh, imagine scenario here, um, a person is asking the ICA, but please, please get me the omelette from the microwave. Um, this has to be translated in a sequence of actions that the robot has to execute in order to get the action done. So, um, you know, if you see the parallel, this can be translated to the ICA gets the omelette from the microwave. Again, the important, what are the important components? There's a verb, there's an object, and there's a tool. So. This is just to say that, in fact, um, you know, we have to concentrate, of, at least as a first approximation, in implementing actions, in detecting objects, and in recognizing and using tools. So these are the three components of a very, let's say, primitive cognitive architecture that can then be used um, for telling the robot what to do in a relatively complex scenarios. Because this, I mean, if we had a robot that can do this, uh, this will be very useful already because we can ask the robot to do tasks of uh, reasonable complexity. So we concentrated our recent, recent research um, concentrated in implementing these basic uh, components. So we've done uh, work on uh, learning actions and on recognizing actions, on uh, learning objects and recognizing objects, and learning tools and using tools. So there's a common thread here that is learning, 
so research in machine learning um, in order to be able to actually uh, avoid doing, let's say, programming by hand the robot, but rather being able to teach the robot how to, how to do actions, how to uh, recognize objects, and how to use tools. Um, and then, of course, I mean, once you learned, you can, uh, you know, in fact, recognize the actions or the objects or use the tools. These are examples. Now, I concentrate for this lecture on only two aspects for the sake of time, uh, learning actions and using tools. So let's move to the learning actions. Um, in this case, what we have to do, first of all, is to give the ability uh, to uh, the teacher to move the robot around. So this is not the typical case. Uh, I mean, if you take a robot, the typical controller would be a position controller that is very stiff, so it doesn't allow you to uh, actually move the robot around. Like, well, in this case, we want the robot to be able to interact with people. A person should be able to grasp the robot hand, move it along a certain trajectory, and the robot will learn this trajectory. So what we have to do, or what we need, is a force controller. Force controller can be done on the iCAP, owing to the fact that we have uh, a set of force store sensors, like places like here and like here. This will be for the leg, this is for the arm. Um, also, we have tactile sensors. They can tell us uh, where a contact is happening, so if the person is grabbing the hand like this, or um, what is the intensity of this contact, the pressure, the local pressure can be measured. So let's start from this. Um, so what we can do with this uh, is basically taking a measurement, it's a six-dimensional vector, uh, forces and torques, and um, subtract inertia, which means uh, the, the dynamical or the internal forces components due to the effect that you have a, an arm attached to the force sensor. Um, take this difference and map the joints so that we have an estimation of the joint torques and then we can build a controller that can be compliant. We can define, we can control the stiffness so it can be a compliant controller or an impedance controller or force controller or even a hybrid controller mixed position force. Um, this um, wanted to prove that this actually works. Uh, so what we done, we went measuring, um, you know, this um, uh, joint torque uh, uh, approximations, um, and uh, we built a little setup like shown here that has a sensor here, which is exactly equivalent uh, of the ICAP sensor, uh, a sensor at the endpoint, and joint uh, torque sensors, and we compared these measurements with all the other possible measurements. What you see is that we basically, no matter how we do the computation, you see almost the same data. Some cases there are small differences, so there's a bit of noise depending on how you do the measurements. The most accurate is clearly measuring at the joints, but since we don't have those sensors on the standard ICAP, wanted to be able to use the force store sensors instead. And this proves that it can actually be done. And in this video, what you see is um, a compliant controller built exactly on this, uh, you know, on what I just described. So this is okay, but um, it, it still lacks uh, one piece of information. In fact, what happens is that um, you need to know for all these computations that I mentioned, although I didn't show the equations, but if you go and look at the equations, you will see that you need to know where the contact with the external environment is happening. To determine that, you need a sensitive scheme. So this is what we design um, on the ICAP. Um, so it's a capacitive scheme. So a set of sensors that covers most of the robot. Um, it's capacitive, which means that it's sort of inspired from uh, what you can find on cell phones, but with two major differences. One is that it has to be flexible, because the surface of the robot is not flat, so it cannot be uh, just a standard uh, you know, cell phone solution. And the other thing is that it has to be able to be sensitive also to touch um, from objects that are not your fingers. So the uh, cell phone works because you're using your fingers to touch it. Your fingers are electrically grounded and so uh, they cause a change in capacitance. But if you try to use a plastic object to uh, push on your cell phone, it doesn't sense anything. So what we had to do is to put um, a ground plane, which means we cover the skin, which is made of flexible PCBs, with a flexible material that is also conductive. 
Um, and in between, we have a soft material like a silicon or other stuff. So this circuit is the actual implementation of the scheme as this triangular shape because beside being flexible, uh, because it's flexible PCB, it's also conformable to the surface of the robot, like it's in principle is shown here. Um, it also um, sort of provides another benefit, which is uh, there's a A to D conversion happening in each triangle, like it's shown here, and these connections allow the information to be sent out of the triangles very efficiently from A to B and so forth, uh, without not having to have a lot of wires. And uh, this saves, uh, let's say, wires by a factor of uh, maybe 50, which um, allows uh, the robot to be wired very efficiently. Otherwise, I mean, if you have thousands of sensors, you will require thousands of wires, and that's not fe feasible. Um, this is a bit more uh, testing to figure out the, the right material for doing the scheme. We ended up with this solution, which is a industrial material, uh, neoprene, um, built in a home, honeycomb-like structure, so it's very uh, soft and uh, but very robust on the other hand. And this is the uh, implementation of the scheme on, uh, on the ICA and on different platforms. So it's so flexible that you can actually take any robot and cover with the scheme. And uh, the next video shows some of the results in uh, covering uh, the robot and then using the scheme. Uh, so this is one iCAD with a fully, uh, fully covered scheme. You see the response of the scheme here. Here the robot is in zero gravity, which means it's just compensating the dynamics, but it's not doing anything unless there's a contact with the outside, which is in this case the finger. So you press, you see here that the robot is sensing the pressure and uses this information to move in such a way to be uh, gentle. Um, so in this case, uh, effectively behave uh, like in a zero gravity environment. And this is the, let's say, actual result with the teaching. So in this case, um, we're just showing that the controller can be used for this. Uh, we're not showing, we're not doing any learning here, so the trajectory is just replicated um, just by uh, re moving the robot through the same positions that have been uh, shown. So it's not, uh, um, in this sense, it's not doing much more than just moving through the same positions. Um, and this, uh, but it's nice because you avoid having to program the robot, uh, which uh, will be a lot of work if you have to do some strange actions uh, that will require um, uh, very complicated programming initially. These components, the force controller and the scheme, are now being used for uh, uh, in a new European project that started last March, um, which has various scenarios as shown here. Uh, basically, the robot is now uh, interacting with the environment in various places. The scheme is used for measuring these interactions, but the robot is doing complex tasks. So it's not just one, one arm moving, it can be you know, the robot balancing, uh, opening drawers, uh, the robot sitting and manipulating soft objects or the robot interacting with a person. And so this requires very more complicated controllers and uh, this uh, future work. Um, so this for uh, the teaching action. Um, the other component that I wanted to show you today um, is the tool use. Uh, tool use is very important. Um, you know, even animals uh, develop uh, a, a basic level of tool use using sticks um, to actually find f food or similar things um, is um, I mean, can be shown here as a, a, a very let's say um, basic uh, cognitive behavior. Um, the experiment is nice for us as roboticists because uh, it can take many variations, like it's shown here. Uh, you can take tools of various shapes, uh, actions can be anything, grasp, push, pull, the objects can be small or large, uh, objects can be far away, so you have to use different tools to actually reach for them and so forth. So the task, um, as it shown here, for the robot will be to figure out the correct tool to do a certain action, do the action to fetch the objects, get, get the object closer, and, and then uh, eventually grasp it. So for doing this, we require a bit more sensory processing. This uh, part of the sensory processing that we're doing now, we have some basic vision. So there's an attention system that is running, identifies um, um, blobs uh, of um, 
let's say, brightly colored objects uh, that are lying on the table. These are segmented, and these blobs are then um, subject for the processing. For the processing is actually object recognition, so there's a um, particular instantiation of a machine learning method that online uh, takes uh, seed features um, from the blobs and uh, builds classifiers on these seed features. So the user can associate names to specific uh, visual instances and these can become uh, objects that are identifiable. Um, another thing that we do is um, we segment the objects, so once you have these you can actually look in the middle of the object to find the edges, the best uh, segment the object from the background, and this can be used as a seed for a tracker, and so you can track the object. So if something happens while you touch the object, like if it rolls away, uh, you can actually track what's happening. And these are typical actions that we generate, so just to show that it's not just object recognition, it can be also very, very dynamic. So this is the point of view of the robot while it's doing certain actions. Um, but again, let me sort of cut a long story short. Um, we spoke about objects, now about uh, what about tools? So tools can be objects that once grasped can change the sort of the capabilities of the robot, can change for sure the kinematics, so the robot can be longer in a sense, it can have, has a longer arm. And, uh, and so we need to know how long it is. Uh, so this is a procedure, very, um, let's say, general. They use uh, optical flow measurements um, to detect the tool tip and to estimate the size of the tool tip um, from, uh, from image, basically. So what the robot does here, shakes the object in front of the camera and uses uh, this, uh, let's say, um, this information from the optical flow to identify the tooltip and learn a transformation that basically um, acquires a new kinematic for the robot arm. Uh, the next video shows how this happens. Um, so this is the optical flow computation, this is the estimation of the tooltip, and this is the projection on the robot's camera. So this is the learning stage, it takes about uh, maybe 25 seconds to obtain a reliable estimate. And after a while you see that um, there's a little dot appearing on the tip of the tool and uh, that represents where the robot believes uh, the tool is located. And that's a prediction that is purely done on kinematic terms, so the robot uh, is not using vision anymore. So vision is used for learning, and now when the tool comes back into the image, you see that uh, the tool tip is correctly tracked. Like you should show here. So it's fairly, fairly accurate, given that the initial data were so, so you know, accurate, as you can see there. Um, now, if you have multiple tools, what you can actually do is learn all of them. Um, so there are a rake, like here, a hole, a stick. Um, they have different sizes, and also they have different behaviors when you start using them against an object. So if you try to pull with a stick, it doesn't work. And then this can be actually learned, so the robot can sort of learn the probability that if you use this object, you manage to pull another object closer. So this is not very effective. And you see from here, because the probability that you get the second object closer when using these to pull is very low. Uh, conversely, if you use a rake, like this one, it's very likely that if you catch the object, the object will end up closer to you. And so this is basically the effect we like to obtain from these or these or whatever object is that to use them for doing certain actions. Conversely, a stick is useful for pushing, as is shown in this video. And this video is just to show that, in fact, the, the object was learned correctly, and you start using it, you can actually push another object. And this is doable also because of the controller that takes into account these new kinematics and generates you know, a movement that correctly reaches, uh, not with the hand, as will be natural, but with the tool tip. So, this is fine, uh, all doable. And now, the next step is to actually be able to grasp the object or to grasp the tool. And this uh, requires some uh, grasping ability, and, uh, and grasping uh, requires uh, 3D vision, because you need to know the shape of the object, um, 
in order to place the fingers to grasp it. And this is an example of a 3D vision obtained of a given object uh, from the ICAP cameras. We have stereo vision, and this is a point cloud that shows again the shape of the object, and this point cloud can be used for planning grasping. Uh, the next slide is an example of grasping. Um, this is actually power grasp. What happens here is that the robot uh, tries to put the palm in a part of the object that is large enough uh, for then closing the fingers around the object. So there's a, uh, the system searches for a region in the object uh, point cloud that has similar size with the robot palm. And you see for different objects, um, manages to do um, almost always uh, a correct grasp. And this is another case, again, with a, with a different shaped object. By the way, the robot doesn't know anything about the shape of these objects. These are all entirely, <clears throat> let's say, um, unknown to the, uh, to the robot. The only information that is used is 3D vision. And uh, this is an example instead with various objects um, for uh, three-finger grasping. So this is more, the more, uh, let's say, refined grasping type. Uh, that is uh, needed when you have to grasp for smaller objects. So, like for this one, it will be possible to use the palm grasp, the power grasp, uh, because you cannot really go around the object if the object is lying on the table. And this is the first example of the three finger grasp on, on this object as is shown here. And um, okay, that's can be brought together in a single experiment, as is shown in the uh, next video, uh, where the robot is asked to grasp the octopus, a little toy that is lying on the table. Uh, the robot knows it cannot reach uh, the object because it's too far away, it's outside the uh, workspace. Uh, actually uses an internal simulation to decide whether it's reachable or not. So the same kinematics knowledge can be reused for reasoning about the object. Then it knows there's a rack here with a set of tools and selects the correct tool for uh, actually reaching this object. And, uh, and then the, it does the movement correctly. So uses the rake in this case to pull the object closer. And then uh, now is, it becomes reachable, it takes the object back into uh, the tool rack. You see, it, it takes a while, but this task, for instance, is done entirely autonomously by the robot, which it, I think is a nice, uh, nice feature. And uh, so, and, and then finally, it, it actually generates a proper grasp. Now, um, you know, in summary, what I've tried to show is the fact that we now are here, the reality, designing small modules, and one day can make the dream come true, which is cook for me, make my bed, go shopping, clean the house, whatever. And this uh, requires building these ba basic building blocks and combining them, something like this, this the, our dream. Uh, this video, just to conclude, um, shows a um, uh, couple of uh, first steps of the ICAD uh, very quickly. Um, you know, beside this uh, sort of initial uh, choreography, it shows that the ICAD can actually make um, a few steps. So we're also going in the direction where the ICAD can be tasked to fetch an objects that it, fetch objects that are far away. Um, and to finish, uh, I wish to say thank you to the uh, European Commission for sponsoring this research and also, of course, to IIT, again, that is uh, allowing us to run these projects.